So, let me turn this off. These are subatomic particles. Um, they are classified in four different types of particles, form our space radiation of uh, environment near Earth. Um, they're all subatomic particles, but we classify them a little differently about where they are and what the what, where they come from, there are plasma, which are charged particles that are just sort of form a uh, sort of soup. Um, there are particles that are coming from the sun, solar particles. There are particles that end up being trapped in the region around the Earth, and we're going to talk about why that could be so if they're going so fast. Why do they get trapped? What about the Earth traps them? And then there are particles coming from way out yonder beyond our solar system, uh, um, those are the ones that interest me as a particle physicist and, and an astroparticle physicist. Um, a little bit of uh, refresher about the particles that make up you and that we know and love, the uh, subatomic particles, the proton, neutron, and electron, and the photon make up most of the particles that we, uh, that we see and uh, and observe, um, they're very, they're very small. They're very light in terms of mass. Uh, in kilograms, they're really, really small. The electron is about 1,800 times lighter than the proton's mass, but everything is really small in mass. The photon doesn't have any mass. In terms of electric charge, the proton and the electron have absolutely opposite charges to each other. Um, in units of Coulomb, which is from some famous uh, scientist. The neutron and the photon do not carry charge, and that does have uh, an effect in terms of what they do in matter. And you know, if you're interested in a Nobel Prize, if you, can, uh, if you can come up with a theory that really understands why this ratio exists, but these are absolutely equal and opposite, um, you will, uh, you'll probably get a unit named after you, not just uh, a Nobel Prize, because it's a mystery uh, uh, why that's so. The proton and the electron are fundamentally different kinds of things, but yet they carry equal and opposite charge to uh, phenomenal precision. And if they didn't, we would all be stuck to each other or flying apart, because charges repel each other if they're the same sign and they attract each other if they're opposite signs. Uh, um, these particles are moving very fast, and because they're moving very fast, they have energy. Um, and if we go down to the subatomic energy uh, level, uh, energy units that we use, like joules, in our physics classes are not really appropriate for describing the energy of really um, small subatomic particles, and so we invent a unit of energy that's based on what it would take to accelerate a particle to a particular energy. And if you have a potential difference, a voltage difference, it creates an electric field. An electric field and a charge will interact to create a force which will accelerate a particle changing its energy from some value to a higher value if it's going faster. And so we define the electron volt as a unit of energy that would result if you took a proton or an electron and passed it through the potential difference, the electric field that's formed from a potential difference of one volt. So the electron volt is not a thing. It's a unit of energy. It's not, you know, you might imagine you'd, you'd want to start a car dealership and create a car called the electron volt, but it would be really low energy if you did. The volt has much more energy than the electron volt. So an electron volt is a unit of energy that is a, ch a charged particle that has a charge of of the uh, charge of an electron or a proton passing through a potential difference of one volt. Um, we think in terms of multiples of that, 10 times that, 100 times that, 1,000 times that, a trillion times that. Um, so a kilo electron volt is a unit of energy 
that would be the result of taking a proton or an electron and passing it through a thousand volts of potential difference. A mega would be a million volts of potential difference. A giga would be 10 to the ninth or a billion volts of energy. You know, how many D cells is that going to take to produce? Um, accelerators are able to produce several TeV, trillion um, electron volts of energy by, by creating that amount of potential difference in an accelerator that might be many miles long, like the one in uh, uh, Geneva, Switzerland, the CERN uh, Large Hadron Collider, which accelerates its particles to about 7 trillion electron volts. Um, so you imagine creating that potential difference that they can accelerate particles. Actually, the universe can do much better than that. It can do better than that by at least a billion times better than that because an experiment that I uh, participated in in uh, Argentina has measured energies on the order of 10 to the 21th electron volts uh, produced by uh, particles in our universe, you know, origins in our universe that we're still trying to understand. So why is energy in these particles important? It's important because that energy can be converted can be uh, transformed into other sources. So these particles carry energy with them, and they can then transform that energy into mass or do stuff with that energy using the most famous equation in science, e equals mc squared. Um, energy can go back and forth from mass can create energy. Energy can create mass. Um, and indeed, you can produce particles with a particle carrying energy that converts that energy into mass, which is how uh, particle physics gets its research done, is that you uh, take electrons or protons and accelerate them to very high energies and then mash them together or mash them into stuff converting the energy into matter. And indeed, if you're up in this space and these particles are zinging around, they are going to convert their energy into mass and stuff happening. And that's where uh, the impact of space radiation occurs, is from the transfer of the energy that these particles carry into materials that uh, we would prefer not receiving that energy. Uh, so where do these particles come from? One of the primary sources of particles is our sun, which produces every, uh, um, you know, every second copious amounts of particles that come to our, uh, come to the Earth. Um, we also have particles that come from extra, you know, galactic sources and extra galactic sources, galactic cosmic rays that are coming. Um, and so those are sort of two primary sources of particles that exist in the region near the Earth and or accumulate in the region uh, near the Earth. Um, solar particles come to us um, not necessarily as a constant value, but a, a value that fluctuates because the sun is not uh, uh, exactly a, uh, uh, a, a, a thing that produces a single amount of light, like a light bulb, um, but produces something that, that has a little bit of fluctuations, um, but will produce a stream of particles, uh, electron, protons, and the nuclei of, uh, of atoms. Um, if they're low, uh, uh, lo low uh, atomic numbers. Uh, and they will be in the region near the Earth at a density of something like 1 to 30 per cubic centimeter. And so imagine a cubic centimeter, you know, that's about like this little piece of you. So up in the region of the Earth from the sun are something on the order of one to 30 uh, particles per, uh, per square cubic centimeter. Um, they are detected now out to even probably further than this because 
the Voyager, I think, has just announced that it's passed beyond the point at which uh, uh, it's in the neighborhood of our solar system, and that's one of the reasons why they were able to essentially detect that is by seeing a change in the uh, uh, direction of the solar wind um, that would be coming uh, from us. It's all coming from the sun as opposed to, to uh, imagine a sail uh, having the direction coming uh, back, you know, backwards or forwards depending on the direction of the wind. They're traveling these particles anywhere from you know, a few hundred to uh, close to a thousand kilometers a second. Um, and so given those uh, particle masses, you can, you can generate something from the solar wind particles of around a kilo electron volts are, are the energy of these particles. Um, it's not a constant. Uh, this is the density versus time in a particular string of a few days. You see that it's not a constant level, but you know there's some quiet levels and some some more uh, spe spectacular levels as well as the uh, the speed of these particles uh, uh, coming. So the solar wind particles are a uh, are a type of particle uh, or a type of source for the particles. They do result in some impacts themselves, is that they they can depending on the rates. Uh, of these particles, they can affect communications, they can affect uh, our phones, GPS, uh, um, they can certainly in even increase some of the drag on, uh, on, on objects in, in, in orbit and uh, they are a source of particles that then can get trapped in our Earth's in our neighborhood of our Earth. Um, and why do they get trapped? Um, is because of a, uh, a feature of the Earth, which is both good and, you know, for some of our satellites, not so good. And that feature is that we have a magnetic field at the Earth. Um, we have a magnetic field, and charged particles in a magnetic field are going to experience a force that rotates them around the direction of a magnetic field. And if you uh, ever attend physics classes in the second semester of physics, if you're not doing this with your hands when you're talking about particles going in a magnetic field and you haven't learned physics in the right hand rule, which is what everybody in physics does when they start to explain a charged particle in a magnetic field is it rotates, positive charged particles are going to rotate like this if your thumb is pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. So you're going to have things that look like, like this. If you had a uniform magnetic field, particles would go like this. They would create little spirals around the magnetic fields. The bigger the uh, spiral, would be coming from a more energetic particle. That won't necessarily trap a particle. However, if you begin to take magnetic field lines and funnel them into a, uh, into a uh, sort of a cone kind of thing, you can actually start to derive something where the particle does this and eventually stops and then heads back out the other direction. That's what we would be happening in our Earth at a couple of spots where the magnetic field lines actually enter the Earth and come out of the Earth and creates essentially the ability of trapping particles in the neighborhood of the Earth in what we, um, what we would call belts, named after a, a brilliant uh, a scientist, Van Allen, that I think discovered this uh, this phenomena, um, and that creates the accumulation of these particles in regions around the Earth, um, which can change the density dramatically. And as uh, solar wind uh, changes and fluctuates, you can see the result of these uh, of these particles uh, and the influence of these particles getting getting trapped and creating. Uh, a very uh, colorful phenomena in our uh, in our atmosphere as the particles interact with our with our atmosphere and uh, and 
radiate photons of particular colors to, to create a sort of a, a phenomena that we call the auroras. Uh, um, and they occur mostly in the, uh, in the uh, up high north and, and, and south because that's where the magnetic field lines uh, come through. So the density of these particles that are trapped around the Earth can change dramatically in these, uh, in these uh, radiation belts becoming very, very high at certain points where you're going to have, instead of a few tens or, or so of particles per cubic centimeter, you might get you know, uh, particles on the order of uh, you know, very extreme densities uh, um, in certain regions that would definitely affect um, affect any objects that go that go through them uh, uh, in those in those levels, and so um, this is uh, depending on which direction the the sun is facing, and so you'll you'll see figures like this where uh, magnetic field uh, lines are coming. You know, the Earth's magnetic field isn't exactly coming out the North Pole, but coming out a little bit offset. And that creates uh, this phenomena, which takes the solar wind particles, and depending on their charge, they're going to accumulate at uh, in in certain uh, certain sides of the uh, of the Earth, creating sort of belts. Because this is something that's sort of going around the uh, going around the sun. This is just a cross-sectional view. Um, so these particles are going to. Uh, um, depending on where, where you're in orbit, are going to have you know, detrimental effect on, uh, on people or things. And we'll talk at the end about how they affect people and things, electronics may, mainly uh, um, at the end of this. Because the uh, Earth's magnetic field is not, uh, uh, is not entirely uh, um, symmetric, and uh, um, that gives rise to some locations where, uh, in fact, the uh, the radiation levels can get uh, can get e extremely high uh, um, and create what are uh, what are like hot spots of of radiation. And there are a couple in the uh, um, that are that are certainly important. There's there's one that's sort of at the uh, uh, in the South Atlantic, called the South Atlantic anomaly, where uh, where you get uh, enormous fluxes of particles that would occur if any if an orbit was going through that. And if you uh, have been t starting to talk about orbits, if you're going around uh, the Earth, you're usually going in orbits that are uh, that have some inclination with respect to the Earth and are. Uh, and the Earth is rotating, and so you're having something that eventually will put the South Atlantic anomaly in the path if you have an orbit that, uh, that has a certain inclination, and that will result in, a, uh, for at least a brief part of the trajectory, super high uh, particle rates. So on top of that will be and these are again uh, uh, in the van in, in the belts will accumulate uh, particles that are energetic, a little bit more energetic than the uh, ordinary uh, um, solar wind particles, but still pr pretty non-energetic in terms of of as high energy as they can be, as uh, which would be the galactic cosmic rays that are. Uh, that are coming from outside of our solar system that can be uh, several thousand times or even a uh, billion times more energetic, but at a rate that's falling with energy. So if I look at certainly the overall rate of particles uh, as a function of energy, what we like to uh, express that rate uh, in is in a what's called a flux. A flux is a rate of particles per area. So imagine a little hoop of area, and you're and you're counting particles going through it. That's a flux, um, 
And so particles per square centimeter, that's the area that we're talking about per second, that would be a flux. And if I look at the flux as a function of the particle energies, in a particular region that, that is informative, and this is in mega electron volts, so this would be one million electron volts. This would be uh, you know, a hundredth of that, so this would be about 10 kilo electron volts. This would be about point, about 100 electron volts. This would be a th 10,000 mega electron volts or 10 giga electron volts. And you look at where these particles are. We've got the, uh, the uh, solar wind particles that are at lower energy, but very high rates. Billions of particles per square centimeter per second. We've got particles that are trapped in our uh, belts uh, around the Earth um, that are uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a mega electron volts. And we've got uh, galactic cosmic rays, which are at very high energy, but at a rate that's pretty low. So this is one particle per square centimeter per second. You know, one, two, three. Um, this is even, you know, this is like one per day or something like that at very, uh, very high energy. And if you go out to where I did my research, in, uh, in Argentina, you're talking about one per square kilometer per year. <laughs> so you need a big detector in order to measure it. Uh, we had a detector that was about 40 miles by 40 miles. That was our detector. And so we would pick up something like 10 or 20 of these per year, of these super high energy, ultra high energy cosmic rays. Uh, um, you don't have to worry about those. Uh, you're too small for, uh, for that. Um, particles can, uh, we, we also can see uh, uh, particles that are, that are atomic nuclei from elements. Um, and if you take an astrophysics course or an astronomy course, you'll learn that uh, all the nuclei that we know and love from all of the, uh, the uh, atoms up to uh, about iron are made in ordinary stars doing nuclear processes of fusion particles together and, and ejecting those at the end of their life. And all particles above iron to about uranium are produced in a single catastrophic event that a heavy star does called a supernova, produces all of the nuclei, atomic nuclei above iron. Um, and so all of you are made out of the result of stars uh, uh, completing their life cycle. Um, but they're also, and, and we're seeing the result of them in, in cosmic rays um, uh, that, are, that are nuclei. And they are very energetic coming from uh, sometimes supernovas that have, that, uh, that have occurred long ago and far away. And they're just reaching the Earth, um, Earth right now. Uh, after traveling through interplanetary space for, uh, for a long time. Uh, and those nuclei uh, have particular uh, um, impact because they're, uh, they actually have a lot of energy associated with their, the fact that they're heavier. And they have a lot of charge associated with them because they are containing a lot of protons. That's what's making up nuclei. And so those effects can have uh, very, very big impacts. Uh, you know, in our atmosphere, what happens is these particles come in in our atmosphere and interact with the nitrogen and the oxygen in our atmosphere and create an actual cascade of particles that rain down through the atmosphere. Most of them are getting absorbed by our atmosphere, but few of them are reaching the Earth. That's what you are hearing at the bottom of that, which is particles that have mostly about one TeV or more of, of energy interacting in our atmosphere, creating a shower of particles, most of which eventually range out in the, uh, in the atmosphere, but some of them actually reaching the Earth. If this was 10 to the 20th 
electron volts, the Earth atmosphere isn't sufficient. You actually get 100 billion that hit the surface of the Earth, again, over an area that is about the size of Moorhead that would uh, rain down that 100 billion particles. So in fact, uh, the fact that we have an atmosphere is very good news for us because it's shielding us. So the magnetic field is trapping particles in our atmosphere and shielding us from them. The atmosphere itself is shielding us. But above this, we are not shielded uh, from, uh, from particle ra radiation. And so those particles are going to uh, are going to impact space uh, humans and space electronics. Even in our uh, atmosphere, as you go up, the rate of these particles increases. Um, there was a, there was a uh, experiment that, uh, that some students did at LSU where they, uh, they put up a Geiger counter in a uh, high altitude balloon and measured the rate using essentially the innards of one of these. You know, just take this apart, take the little tube out in the circuit and fly it in a balloon. And it goes from the counting rate that you're hearing, which was like one every five seconds, to hundreds per second at about 30, 40, 50,000 feet. So the next time you're flying through a, uh, a cross, uh, long distance airline flight, think of the fact that, you know, one of these would be going zzzing, you know, it would, it would, uh, um, there's a lot higher rate and fortunately you and I don't do that, but airline pilots and um, flight personnel do. Charge particles, when they pass through material, there's a phenomena that they, transfer that energy into disrupting the electron clouds around atoms and releasing those electrons from the atom, which is called ionization. When you ionize an atom, you're removing electrons from them. So imagine the passage of these energetic particles. And what they're doing is they're giving enough energy to the electrons in the atomic clouds and the molecular clouds in the matter enough energy to come out of the atom, springing those electrons, that ionization then creates a lot of extra charge that is remaining in the material. Um, and though that extra amount of charge is what does the damage to the material, um, it leaves sort of destruction in its, its weight. Um, so the proportion of that amount of ionization is a function of the energy of the particle, the speed of the particle, and the particle's charge. And that's where if you've got a, a heavy ion, uh, you know, like a carbon nuclei or an iron nuclei, the amount of ionization is proportional to the charge squared, which uh, in physics we symbolize the charge of a nuclei with the, with the, uh, the symbol Z. So it goes as Z squared. And so heavy ions actually have a much, much larger impact on materials uh, in this way. Uh, um, we're going to come up with a bunch, unfortunately, uh, there's so many units that relate to radiation dosage and, and impact that it starts to get uh, pretty confusing. But we think of it in terms of, of radiation in terms of a standard unit, the RAD, a radiation observed do dose, which is related to the amount of energy per mass of material that is being uh, deposited by the particle that's, that's doing the, the dose. And ergs is another en energy unit. Uh, um, and there's a parallel system of units that is called the System International uh, uh, Unit that uh, happens to use something that's a multiple of that called the gray after uh, a famous scientist who gets a unit named after him. Um, and a gray is related to a rad by just a factor of a, of a hundred. So, something that, it, that then uh, has a large amount of energy loss per, per gram, has a lot of radiation-observed dose, 
and you're going to accumulate that dose in materials as a, f as a result of these particles passing through every square centimeter per second of material, depositing their energy uh, in that material. So the living things, the bad thing is uh, disrupting DNA. Um, and so uh, this little diagram is hard to see, but if you've got a, uh, a particle that's, uh, that's maybe a single uh, electron or a photon or something, can deposit their energy and by virtue of not having a whole lot of charge or a whole lot of, uh, uh, of energy to lose, might break a single strand of a DNA uh, inside a cell. Um, and a heavy ion, though, deposits more energy and results in a greater probability and can even break multiple strands of, of DNA. Uh, and if you do this with enough regularity, the body is not able to recover uh, and you start to get more and more mutations and disruptions and that's where you're building the cancers and, uh, and in some cases uh, death. Um, and so long-term exposure to radiation is a, uh, is a serious uh, uh, effect in, uh, um, in space. Um, here's a couple of plots of dosage equivalent um, and when you're talking about humans they use yet another set of units um, to talk about something that's a equivalent for a person um, called the the REM which is a, defined as a radiant equivalent man um, and relates to the dosage rad by a quality factor that depends on the particle that is depositing the, uh, the, the, the energy. And again, unfortunately, they, uh, they have a separate system of international uh, standards which uses a unit sievert, which is related simply to the REM uh, and uses a famous physicist as its, uh, as its unit. Uh, um, so in sieverts, um, here is uh, uh, two, two things. One is somebody that's on the ISS and here's somebody that's on a trip to Mars and how many millisieverts per day they're receiving during that trip on average. Um, so on the ISS it's something like about a half mil a millisievert per day and on the trip to Mars, it's sort of uh, in excess of one millisievert per day. Um, so to, to think about what that means in terms of you on the Earth in a typical year due to these uh, cosmic ray particles and radiation that's uh, in the material of the Earth, which is, does have some radioactive uh, substances, you accumulate about in a year two millisieverts per year. So these pe people are doing it sort of on a day uh, level. And so to look at what it means in terms of catastrophicness for humans, um, roughly 10,000 millisieverts is death right away. Um, you know, something to the level of about half uh, of that is what uh, the uh, people that, you know, the, uh, you, most of you weren't born yet, uh, but in 1986 there was a major uh, um, nuclear uh, uh, catastrophe in Chernobyl um, that resulted in a lot of deaths um, due to radiation workers uh, trying to, uh, trying to, uh, uh, avert uh, even bigger catastrophe and they were receiving on order of something like 6,000 millisieverts. Um, you're expected to die with about half that much. You're expected to get definitely sick with about a, a thousand of them. Remember you're on the trip to Mars which is taking many many months, in fact years, going back and forth at one a day. A thousand you're getting sick um, the people uh, cleaning up at Fukushima were getting something like 400 an hour. 
um, really bad thing. If you get a typical CT scan, you're getting about 10 to 15. You know, dental x-ray is something like 0.1 or 0.01. Again, a typical dose in a year is something like two. And so long-term voyages are something that they're going to have to figure out because they are accumulating substantial amounts of radiation dose, which accumulates, and eventually the body is not able to recover. What about electronics, which is if you're building things and trying to build things that reliably operate, um, Radiation has also a substantial impact to electronics. For, again, the same phenomena occurs is that these particles the, from the radiation are entering material and ionizing the material. And when they ionize the material, they release electrons from atoms. In semiconductor materials, uh, uh, we often think in terms of the uh, the positiveness that they leave behind and the electron. We think of a uh, electron hole pair, which is the absence of electron is, is sort of a hole. Um, and so in semiconductor uh, devices, we have that phenomena occurring as well. But we also have electric fields that are resulting in uh, voltage differences that are maintained. And so we have, uh, for the electrons, when they get released, they drift away in a uh, solid state material as a result of the electric field, but the holes that are left behind, the positive charges that are left behind, generally stick around. And so um, the accumulation of that positive charge can result in bad effects um, to, uh, to electronics. And that's one of the ways that this radiation is going to have an impact over a long term as the accumulation of, of charge accumulation in solid state devices um, results in what would, you know, the charge is going to affect the voltage differences that are there. It's going to uh, affect the threshold voltages and, and ultimately affect the performance uh, um, if you change those uh, those uh, uh, voltage levels, um, you can result in more current flowing through your devices and more power being consumed and eventually the devices stop functioning as, a, uh, uh, as you, would, you would want. Um, this is you know, not necessarily a lecture on semiconductor devices, which I'm not a uh, qualified expert, but to think about somehow or another that accumulating dose resulting in the accumulation of charge that's left over that affects the behavior of electronic devices uh, in, a, in a way that might, uh, you know, if you're up in space, you have a limited amount of power that is provided by solar panels and batteries and everything else. And so if you affect something that changes that amount of power, you can rapidly find yourself in a position where you're not able to uh, uh, function a any longer. And so the device stops working as, as that. Um, that's one sort of way that these particles can accumulate. Uh, even if they're lower energy, they don't necessarily have a catastrophic event but an accumulated uh, phenomena that results from the lower energy particles that manage to get through, uh, through material. Um, if you're a heavy ion or a very energetic proton or something going through material, one particle can do enough damage to, uh, to adversely affect, um, affect a device by just one particle Cross, crossing through, depositing a lot of energy and a lot of charge that is that is created enough to uh, to uh, to affect. There are a couple of particular phenomena that uh, I think they talk about uh, often in uh, um, in radiation uh, effects on on uh, sol solid state electronics in space. One is the uh, the latch up, which is resulting in a uh, a sort of a sustained 
uh, state in the electronics um, that results in a high current uh, state um, which um, is sustained by a single particle interaction. And, uh, and when you have a high current in electronics, if you take your electronic class, when you have a high current and you have some material that doesn't have uh, zero resistance but has some amount of resistance, you're going to get power, you're going to get heat created, uh, and it could be enough to actually develop a sort of a thermal runaway where the, the device just uh, melts um, uh, as a result of, of that. Um, we also, that's sort of a the latch-up characteristic. Uh, a single event upset is affecting the sort of the logic level or the, uh, the, the state if you have a uh, solid state device that has sort of two states that it's going between. Um, you can actually change the state of that uh, electronic uh, device by uh, throwing enough charge to actually alter the the state. That's going to affect mainly memory cells and other logic devices like flip-flops and, and, and other things. And it can change the logic state that either results in bad data or worse, you can create something where that, uh, that phenomena is permanent where you essentially could stick a bit on a particular uh, electronic uh, uh, memory cell or, or operation cell and, uh, and result in a permanent state that's not correctable, that you can't uh, develop a correction for and could, uh, if, it's, you know, if it's important for operations, it can result in something that just can't operate. And so both of these phenomena occur primarily as a result of highly ionizing single particle uh, events as opposed to an accumulation over months or years. Um, they result in um, single event phenomena. Um, and so uh, uh, you have a probability for that. Um, the experts in electronics try to develop uh, uh, electronics that, uh, that are better able to withstand this. Radi high radiation en environment, and if uh, if you want to go into that field, it's uh, uh, definitely uh, it's it's important to uh, develop electronics that are going to be robust and and uh, and continue behaving uh, uh, that. So sort of uh, sort of a recap uh, to some of the things that that charged particles can do. They can certainly uh, charge up electronics um, resulting in uh, bad electronic phenomena. They, above a certain level, they begin to affect us, affect astronauts, uh, uh, causing uh, um, damage to DNA. And uh, um, those are mainly going to be if you're passing through high radiation environments of things on the order of an MEV or, or so. Um, and the very high energy events are going to cause these things like single event upsets and, and latch ups uh, um, there. Uh, uh, also these other things are going to uh, result in other things that might be, uh, um, you know, that might uh, uh, as well, uh, you know, erode surfaces and, and change uh, uh, aspects um, of a surface. Uh, uh, of material, but I think I've focused on sort of two phenomena, uh, one dealing with electronics, one dealing with humans. Um, so what can we do? Um, you know, the you know, obvious thing is to try to put stuff in the way between us or your electronics and these particles. Um, that's called shielding. Um, and shielding does have some some effect um, that you can shield by putting material in between you and the particles or your electronics in the, in the particles. Um, this will be uh, sort of a, a plot of what happens to the, uh, the three-year dosage if you put a certain amount of shielding of aluminum 
Um, this is a strange unit of grams per centimeter squared. You've got to multiply by uh, um, or divide by the density of aluminum, which is something, I think, 2.7 grams per cubic centimeters to put this in, in, in centimeters or lengths. But there it is up there in the top in inches. So this is about a half an inch. In about a half an inch of aluminum shields almost all of the electrons. But you see as you, uh, as you look at the protons, which are heavier particles, um, you in fact don't shield much against the trapped protons and um, energetic heavy, ion, uh, heavy particles. And it becomes, uh, you know, you, yeah, you can say I can keep adding material, but material is mass. And so if you're going to, uh, if you're going to start to put uh, tons of material up into space, you're going to need to uh, develop your own rocket company to get it up there because it's very expensive every kilogram of material that you put up in space. And so if we're making a little cube set, you're restricted to something like a couple of kilograms per unit, you know, one or two kilograms per unit. So you don't have much allowance to put a lot of shielding in the way uh, of that. And you're not, uh, so you can affect some of the particles, but not some other of the particles. Uh, um, similarly, this is sort of penetration range, depending on particular types of uh, things that we've already uh, created, like spacesuits and, uh, and particular uh, shuttles and other things, how much material is in between the devices and, uh, and that. So I think shielding is one thing that people um, spend a lot of time on to optimize the amount of shielding, which is an optimization of material mass budget and the amount of, of impact that you do to, to mitigate um, radiation. Um, so when you put material in front of a uh, in in front of particles, um, they don't just go in to a particular distance and stop. Some particles can actually have interactions which make the problem even worse than the sh than having nothing at all. Um, so if you create a shower of particles like you saw in the atmosphere from that picture of a heavy uh, energetic nuclei striking the top of an atmosphere creates a shower. Then instead of stopping the particle, you've actually got it mad and it produces hundreds of particles that eject into your, uh, into your electronics or your device. And that can be actually worse than that. And so one of the features that, is, in fact, we've found in some of our CubeSats is that less is more. <laughs> because uh, uh, sometimes you'd prefer to have less shielding or a minimum amount of shielding that stops some particles and doesn't cause others to get mad. And so I think that is, uh, I think, what I had to. Uh, uh, plan to, to cover, but I think to, to recap, we have several different sources for radiation that uh, is in the neighborhood of the Earth. We have particles that have certain energy, and those particles then lose their energy in the materials that we would like it, in many cases, not to do. Uh, and so that results in particular phenomena either uh, detrimental to uh, human life or to electronics. And part of your job is to design spacecraft and uh, shielding that in fact try to mitigate that because we're not going to turn the sun or the galaxy off. So those particles are here and we have to adapt our, our, our particular devices to them. There are, 
there are spaces, there are places where they're much reduced. They're not places that I've, I've seen where the, uh, the rate goes to zero. But there are obviously, as you saw in some of those diagrams, there are places where it's much worse than others. And so I think if you're, uh, if you're doing something, you might take advantage of that in terms of the altitude that you're, that you're flying your, uh, your spacecraft to take advantage of, of where it would be less. But there isn't anything like even at the uh, ISS uh, orbit, they're still getting, a, the, the humans are still getting a fairly high dose compared to you on the Earth and electronics as well. And so I think there, there's little or no place that you can find it really being quiet, even if you leave the, uh, leave the uh, orbit of the Earth entirely and go off into deep space. The galactic cosmic rays, which will cause these single event latch-ups and the, uh, the catastrophic phenomena are still there because they're, they're, they're essentially bathing the entire galaxy or, or even intergalactic space as well because they're the result of supernovas that have uh, ejected their stuff in all directions. Yeah? When you showed that diagram with the uh, South Atlantic anomaly, there was a huge spot over South America. Does that not move? I believe that's pretty much located there, and I think there's uh, there's some diagrams that show how the magnetic fields do these these strange things that create uh, sort of low spots where uh, where these particles can essentially uh, these trapped particles can get very near the uh, the Earth's orbit and create these sort of these very high intensity, and they pretty much stay where they where they are, which is sort of why it's called, why, why it's called that and not the sort of the wandering anomaly. Uh, uh, and so it is something that is, is then uh, can be put into various models so that when you're doing your orbital calculations, you can see sort of what is going to be the, uh, the amount of time duration that you're spending in that. Or in fact, if you need to, you could try to, try to choose an inclination or an orbit that would avoid, that would avoid those things if, uh, if you have, but you might even have some things where you might turn off electronics while, uh, while you're passing through some things. You might do some things to try to, uh, to, try to avoid having something where you create a, uh, a command or something, a, 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 a corrupt piece of data that causes the uh, causes something to uh, to permanently uh, do something you don't want to do. You have a question? Uh, the yeah. Like were they discovered by like just like looking and then seeing that that the uh, spirals like how were they discovered like? Mm -hmm. I think they did certainly measure some uh, uh, high in intensity, and then you look at uh, um, you look at your magnetic field lines, and you develop a model. I mean, often when uh, when you're a scientist, that's what you do: is you uh, you look at some phenomena, and then you develop some sort of model for what's what's causing it, and then you look at uh, well, if that model exists, then I should see some uh, I should be able to predict some phenomena. About what type of particles and uh, what energies they would they would do by knowing the uh, measuring the magnetic field intensity dur during the uh, Earth and having probes and so a lot of space experiments have explored the magnetic field around the Earth and the density of these particles and so there are a lot of experiments that focus on those kinds of things and and providing uh, uh, providing uh, uh, detailed experimental results for theorists to develop a theory uh, uh, resulting it in. Uh, Van Allen was just one of the physicists back in the olden days of, of space science, which is you know, 50 years ago or so, uh, who did a lot of work in that and is, is well known for those, uh, um, you know, for that investigation that, that results in, in uh, our understanding of, of these belts. Other questions? <laughs>